I totally better um, get my stuff together there now after the 30 second countdown. I got distracted by something on the other computer. So welcome here today. This is Judy from the Vid Academy. And last time I did an interview with someone, basically I'm practicing going live and I'm practicing with different softwares and and different um, things that I can use. So last time I went live with Nala Summers, who is an adventurer who promotes kindness. And we just went live on Zoom and went into Zoom and then pressed go live on YouTube. So it was a really easy solution, but I did have to kind of edit it afterwards to add in kind of you know the graphics and stuff like that so I wanted to scale it up a bit so th this time I'm using StreamYard and you can use a free version of StreamYard but you have to live with the logo but to pay I think it's 25 euro a month you get to add your own overlays broadcast to multiple different platforms so right now I should be on Facebook LinkedIn and YouTube but it's all a process of discovery but I'm so lucky today to have a wonderful really wonderful person here and it is time Kiki. Now, just to introduce him there fast, I'm sure a lot of you already know him. Um, Ty Kiki is so many great things that he cannot be pigeonholed into one title. He is a comedian, an actor, a writer, a director, a musician, a painter and decorator. And according to his Facebook page, he is also Michelle Smith de Bruyne's ex. Uh, I'll ask you about that a little bit later. But <laughs> Ty, I met you more than 20 years ago through a school yeah. friend. And I remember meeting you and thinking you were a normal, nice person. And then one night I was at home watching TV with my mom and there you were singing hallelujah on one of these like major irish shows that i was like i know him oh my god he's famous oh my god i know a famous person so you're my first <laughs> claim to fame uh... and <laughs> Since then, you've created TV shows, acted in multiple films, written and delivered comedy gigs and appeared in loads of ads. And I think the, the biggest thing that I noticed is that you didn't waste any time during the pandemic and you continued to work online and throughout it. And more recently, your video content has pretty much exploded on social media. Um, so with all that in mind, can you remember the first video you ever uploaded? Uh, what was it about and how did you make it? Yeah, so there is, there's, a, I suppose there's two, right? So I used to work with, I think you might know him, a filmmaker called Sean O'Connor years ago. He's based in Corks from Kerry. He's exceptional. So we did some movies. I think we did a film in 2010, maybe, called Tearing Strips, which is basically me playing a homeless person in a park. And uh, two women come along and I trick them into giving me uh, money and play the kind of the poor mouth. And then I ultimately used the money to, to get wrecked in the hotel room, right? So it was just a short little slightly offbeat kind of gag made into a film. Sean made it look beautiful. And uh, Sean was the first person to shoot something that when I saw it, I was like, oh my God, that looks good. Do you know? Do you remember like back in the day when people would shoot stuff? It was either on their phones or with cameras and it would always look terrible, like the kind of student film thing. And then Sean, and I'm not saying that he's he is brilliant, but to my mind back then, I was like mind blown by how good it looked. Um. So that was my first experience. And then you put it up on Facebook and people are commenting on it. And you're like, oh my God, like, oh, do they like it? And a lot of people did like it, which was great. I'd say the first sketch I did again was with Sean a couple of years later. I had a sketch crew called Cahoots, but we weren't called Cahoots yet. We were called Splurge at the time, would you believe? Which actually in hindsight now I think was a better name. We should have stuck with it. But we shot a kind of a mindfulness meditation sketch in Laurel. So it was myself, Laura Manny and Dominic McHale. And we did a sketch together. It shot in Laura's mother's house. Um, something to do with mindfulness. I can't remember exactly how it went, but I do remember ending up uh, shouting at a horse in her mother's garden. And um, we put it up online, particularly Twitter, and it did quite well, but it, it got people who were kind of like, I would have respected in the TV and film world, like people like Mark O'Halloran retweeted it and said they really liked it and stuff. And that was the start for them. My head was just completely gone that I suppose I realized I was in this era where you could actually just go out and make stuff and pretty much anyone can see it. Do you, know, do you know, so the DIY thing probably kicked in at that point, right? I think, although the work ethics sadly didn't. <laughs> But then, you know, I suppose it must have been really difficult for you as well, though, because you were working with like professional broadcasters like RT and stuff like that. Were you thinking that, oh, if I make my own content, it's going to confuse people. I better stay with kind of the this kind of stuff where the, they come in and do it for me. Was there any fear? Yeah. Do you know, do you know what it is? Right. And I'd say it to people who are starting off like th there's never there's never a good reason not to do loads of things yourself. There really isn't. I can't think of any because. I found we were lucky enough to, so some of the stuff that we'd done, particularly myself and Sean's early film uh, stuff had caught the eye of people in RT and uh, they were interested in it. But then you see, we had no leverage. So you'd be at meetings at RT and they'd definitely be interested in your material, but you're giving them every reason to reject you 
um if it's a if it's a strange month or if it's you know what i mean like you're up against people who mm-hmm. have leverage so they already have online careers or or they've gotten really well thought of stand-ups um so i kind of found that the rt experience i really felt to myself like you, the, the people these days who are making their own material and then rt might come and seek them out that's the way to do it like if i was starting off again i wouldn't worry so much about the rts of the world um i'd be thinking how do i get really good at my stuff here like and how do i do as much of it i can myself um that's costing as little as possible and then let the rts like take care of themselves if yeah. that makes any sense if that's in any way helpful and you know i just think that that's kind of more like useful well not more useful but like it's more easy to do today i think when you started making your own content that was very very difficult to do and you i think it was a gamble you know nowadays it's probably not considered a gamble but i think for you at that moment in time it probably was um mm. the concern that people wouldn't think that you were as professional because it's not lit as well or but then again as you said sean was such a brilliant pr- video maker pr- filmmaker at that time anyway so he 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 took the hard work for you but mm. how do you come up with video ideas when I watch your videos like you've got such a range of different topics like from you know the mindfulness app and politics especially Brexit you know like things like I know I always knew you were super intelligent like you always had like loads of information and loads of history and stuff like that and the way that you're able to distill these really complex ideas into funny sketches that even I can understand I'm like I actually learned something so not only are you entertaining you're also educating through these sketches but how do you come up with your video ideas nowadays and I'd love to know how your process has changed throughout the years for coming up with these ideas yeah they've definitely it has definitely changed I think there's two that and I've been thinking about it today like there's two routes in so I've just put out a video that um deals in some way with disparity of wealth between between the west and and sub-saharan Africa for instance right so I mean like it's that type of stuff, you're just in a really tricky area because you could be accused of virtue signaling. I don't get too bogged down on kind of the accusations anyway, to be honest with you, like, cause you just kind of have to drive on in life really, like don't you and just do your own thing. But if you're gonna take on something like that, it is very loaded. It's not funny on paper at all. <laughs> so the fu- what I find is you need to do your research first and for- foremost, right? So, and it can't usually just be YouTube videos. Like you've got to do a bit of reading. If you find um, like economists or philosophers or whatever that have already talked about the topic and understand it very well. What's interesting for me is um, say for instance, like the way in which the West has its boot on Sub-Saharan Africa's neck. There's loads of information out there, but it's not, you won't see it on RT or anything like, you won't see it on mainstream news. So all the info is there, but people aren't talking about it as much. That seems to me very fertile then. Uh, weirdly I don't know why I don't really fully know why I'm drawn to these things except I would like to say I suppose usually I do care about the causes as well like without making myself out to be some sort of hero I do honestly give a shit that I'm interested in the area so if I put that together with the research and try and find can I somehow make this funny and also distill it into 220 so I mostly do stuff on Twitter as well which actually has been a godsend because I'm the type of guy that needs to be reined in constantly because I'm very prone to just prolonging the gag until it's no longer funny in two minutes 20 if you're going to distill something like you know disparity of wealth in sub-saharan africa and try and squeeze in a few jokes as well you're under serious pressure like and you've got to just kind of move on move it on so i suppose to answer your question there's kind of two modes for me these days one it would be an issue-based thing and that would be about making the, the geopolitical story make some sort of sense and have a few gags in it that process for me would be like two or three days of research, uh, write a script over the course of a day, hopefully shoot it in a morning and edit it that evening. You could be talking about five days, like for a sketch where, as you know, like you're not getting paid for that sketch. Like, so you'd want to, you'd want to be looking big picture for this kind of stuff. But thankfully for me, I do end up these days. Now I could get work out of a sketch that on paper, I didn't get any money for at all, but like, you, you know, you're getting more followers and people coming to your gigs. So that's the first one. But then the second one can sometimes just be character driven. So the sketch would begin with the character and what the character is doing in this particular scenario. There, it's usually much easier to write because I don't have to go and research anything for three days. I usually have characters just kind of rolling around my head. Um, And it's that second one, I think, as a comedian, I suppose I'm more interested in because... No, sorry, not more interested in, I'm just as interested in the geopolitical stuff, but if you're going to create longer form work, which is ultimately what I want to do, again, 
you have to build that up, I find anyway, in comedy with characters. I'm not sure if you'd watch a geopolitical sketch I put together for three hours. Like, I don't know what I expect anyone to do that really. And um, so characters are where it's won and lost. And that's where I'm at the moment now, just transitioning a little bit from the kind of really heavy political sketches into doing longer form work with characters is, is literally what I'm, that's my 2022 uh, plan anyway, I think. I'm so happy to hear that you're taking two days to research, the day to script, a day to film and edit, because, you know, I put a YouTube video together, like a tutorial, say, and I, it takes me the same length of time, you know, and it's not like a, oh, I film and then edit and I'm finished at five o'clock that evening. It's like I'm tearing my hair out at, at one in the morning, trying to piece oh. it all together and get the graphics right and stuff like that. And then you see other people's YouTube videos and they're uploading once a week and you're like, why am I slow? Like, what, why is, what's stopping me from being able to do that? Like, so that's very comforting for me to hear. Well, you're not slow. Like that's for sure. You're not. I, I would say, and from what you know, from what I know of you and your work, you're dedicated. Like, and you're trying to make the thing as strong as. And I'm not here to, to create a puff piece for you. I mean, I can do that off camera. <laughs> but uh, but I think thoroughness is the way to go. Like so, I mean, to to in my stuff, for instance, I I usually won't sign off on a script unless every line in the script I can I can argue why it's there. Do you know what I mean? Like it makes sense for me to be, if, if there's any line where I'm just going, that's just filler now, or then obviously I, I don't know it well enough. And I, I always kind of play the role of somebody watching it um, and would they, if they knew this topic much more than I do, which of course, like most people do, <laughs> like how, how would they interrogate what I've done? How would they criticize it? So I try and play that out myself, you know, particularly in the geopolitical stuff, because if you're going to venture in there, you kind of have to do the research. I, I was going to say, you'd have to know your stuff. I don't know my stuff. At the end of the day, I'm a comedian. And I'm just fucking reading and watching videos like any other civilian. But I try to do that to the extent where I can kind of back up uh, moving this thing into comedy, I suppose. And mm -hmm. it just takes time. Like I was listening to something the other night. There was someone saying like the life work balance. It's just an illusion. Like you know, <laughs> if you're going to do good work, you're going to be like storming into that. And then you're going to look after your kids over here. Like and you'll storm into that for a while, like in terms of some sort of metronome balance thing i think it could be a, an illusion it certainly is for me and i suppose to sum up this long blathering uh, aside it would be to say that i just want to make strong work and that usually it just takes as long as it takes then like if i'm researching and i don't have it and i'm still interested in the topic i'll go to three or four days or five days or a week or i'll put it on i've got ideas for geopolitical sketches that i still haven't done because i don't understand the topic well enough i haven't read enough um, and I can't just sit down reading all week like as I have to earn a couple of it as well. So I get to it when I get to it. But it's it's ready when it's ready. Like definitely, I think. Yeah. And I think the work life balance is so much harder when you're working for someone like, you know, it's changed for me anyway, since I, I left a, a job because, you know, if. I work when I kind of get feel inspired to work. Not, not I'll work all day. Like, but like if I get an idea at ten o'clock at night, I'll I'll go with that idea. But then yeah. you can't, you know, call in and say, "Oh, I actually worked for four hours last night, so I'm going to sleep in there until one o'clock, and I'll talk to you all at one." Like they're like, "Well, we have a meeting yeah. at nine. You have to be there." Whereas when you're on your own, that's one of the benefits. You can kind of just roll with it when you feel like it. And I think that that's better. The better stuff comes out of that time where you're not just forcing yourself to sit there and come up with ideas. But totally. I love it. I love it. Like I took most of Christmas yeah. off now because I literally run. And it's an important thing to say as well. Coming up to Christmas, I noticed that I'd completely run out of ideas. Like I had nothing. I really had nothing. Like, and I, I'm not being melodramatic saying that. I was like, oh, there's nothing new coming here. And I'd started working on a couple of bigger, longer form projects. And I was like, well, sure, I'm useless to the person I'm working with here. So I just took time off. Like you have to have like my buddy of mine, Dominic, calls it a kind of an input uh, stage. You know, you need your input stage too, or there's nothing to output then. You know, so you just like just read, watch. I just watched a lot of it. Watch Father Ted. Went for walks, chilled out, ate like loads, um, put on a few holiday pounds, and here I am now in early January. <laughs> well, the good thing is no one sees us from exactly. like here down anymore. So. <laughs> exactly, you know, I've, I've nothing left to lose. You know. <laughs> so another thing that I actually am cu really curious about myself because sometimes when I see your videos like you know for example there's one where you're in your garden and it's 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 you and one character and you and another character and I'm like is is someone filming for him or is he just setting up a tripod in his garden and filming this himself now there's some content that I'm like that was definitely 
professional help in there. Yeah, like you yeah. can see, you know, so stuff is handheld and things like that. But from the majority of stuff, do you get help with video production or do you film and edit it on your own? It's a mixture of the two for the shooting. So some of the, con I mean, there's, I did a British Empire one and I think there's like seven or eight characters. And again, my buddy Dom shot that. I'd have a little army of people, like a very small army, you know, I should say, I'm not sure, with this constituted army. One of them is my daughter, my 17 year old daughter. So we'd great crack during the summer. Like it was real kind of bonding kind of crack as well, you know, because she's doing more stuff like off camera than on camera these days, but um, she's just brilliant. And um, we'd have a bit of crack and we we got some good outtakes and stuff like that. So sometimes I'd need physical help there. And as I say, Dom was like fantastic in those early stages of the sketches last year that were doing quite well. But um, when it comes to the edit, then I always edit on my own. And I and this would be, I think, worth saying, like about literally about a year ago, I'd say maybe 18 months ago, maybe I, re I couldn't really edit. And I just I often would put off doing sketches because. I didn't want to lumber somebody when I couldn't pay them and I felt that I didn't have technical skills. Like if anybody knows me, like from the, from, if anybody knows me, like who, who <laughs> um, no, but from my band days, I was the guy who wasn't allowed near technology. Like literally, like I wouldn't be, I, I would be allowed hump in the gear, like, and, and then I'd have to step away from the cables in case I broke something or broke a knob off the, off the amp. And um, so I just don't you know computers just terrify me. But even I could do it. I suppose it's worth saying that, that um, there was a friend of mine, Brian O'Connor, and then there's Sean O'Connor, a few other people, uh, Keen Toomey, great filmmaker, Keen Toomey, um, show me the basics, final cut, he even explained it for someone like me, and then it's just trial and error. And then what it is, is YouTube videos, as you say, it's you at two o'clock in the morning going, how do you do this exact thing? You watch that YouTube video, you learn that thing, you'll probably have to watch it again next week. But um, I'm just dogged though, I suppose. I'm looking at the big picture going, I want to do these sketches. I can't afford to bring other people in. Um, I need to do them though. I need to power through. I won't take no for an answer. If that means I'm going to have to teach myself to edit for a week, doing about six or 70 hours, so be it. And that's that's kind of what I did. So to answer your question, it's a bit of two. If I, if I need someone there, I definitely will have them there. Although I've shot sketches completely on my own. So like just tripod, if it'd usually be two characters though. If there's more than two characters, I'd definitely get someone to help me. But if there's two characters, tripod shoot one here one there and it's just working out the um not crossing the line thing like even you know i i learned that as one of the big things kind of to not to do like is to cross the line i mean i like my skill set is very very meager like um but yeah i'm the editing i do and then i find with the editing as well sorry i know this is a bit rambly but i find with the editing it gets better and better a tiny little bit all the time so like the videos I'm doing lately, there's little bits of overlap with audio. Like I've learned little tricks that now I basically have gotten as good as a not very good person can get, I think, maybe. And that's I've actually noticed that. I've noticed there's like L cuts and J cuts and the audio is kind of, and, and that, that's exactly where I was thinking. I was like, he must mm. have some professional editor. So congratulations for like, wow. you know, like getting there yourself, you know, because I know what it's like, especially with Final Cut Pro. I, I don't use that anymore. I used it for a while, like use Premiere more now. And then I teach Rush, which is... Right. um an easier version of Premiere Pro kind of for beginners, but people tend to enjoy it. And, you know, you don't use a lot of animations. You don't need them. Your your pieces are very character driven and stuff, but this is kind of drag and drop animated text and yeah. stuff. So so people can kind of make fancy or um, kind of business videos anyway without uh, a lot of help. But you kind of answered this earlier with the Twitter piece because you did kind of explode on, on Twitter. And then mm -hmm. within Twitter, you're limited to the 220 seconds and you kind of called that more of a positive thing than a negative thing. But do you make before I used to make a video and I'd put it on every platform that I could. I might shorten a version if I wanted to put it on Twitter. But do you think about the platform while you're in the planning stage of your video and think, I'm going to make this for Twitter and I'm not going to put it on Instagram or I'm going to make this for Instagram and not put it on TikTok? Or how do you kind of work that? No. So, and I tell you now, I mean, hopefully this will be useful to people, but I'm, I'm not telling, telling people to do this at all. It's just what I've ended up doing. I usually make the sketch um with what do I think is going to be strong in mind, first of all, and then I've kind of largely given up a little bit with the other uh, platforms. I'll still put it up there because I have followers on Facebook and I'm delighted to have them and I respect them and they're great and they're not on Twitter. But if I didn't have those people, I don't know what I even bother because I kind of find like, if you find one thing that works for you, like put it this way, I, I kept being included in compilations over the last 80 months of people who've like taken off on social media, but 
I don't have any following to talk of at all in tic- on TikTok or Instagram or whatever. You know, I can't I can't connect with the Insta Huns at all at all. <laughs> but um, I seem to be included because Twitter seems to be maybe the highest currency one, I think, because it's like seems to be a lot of, you know, uh, journalists and high profile comics and stuff on there sharing stuff. So and that, that wasn't a deliberate decision either. I usually just spend a lot of time on Twitter because it's the one that I kind of liked the most. I, we done all our videos in cahoots on Facebook, so it wasn't even a conscious decision. I started putting stuff up there, though, and I was like, whoa, the political stuff seems to work way better here. Like, on overnight, then I literally kind of changed tack. So to answer your question, I think if you can get one of them right, you're probably grand. Like, if you find that your stuff works on TikTok, I'd say, belt on, you know? I mean, some people are trying to tailor for each one. I don't think of that at all. Because then mm-hmm. you're, then you're, I mean, you're already doing a little bit of tailoring in your mind when you're about to put stuff out, because you're like, will this work here or not? I mean, nobody's putting out, I don't think, 100% exactly the thing they want to do with no conscious thought at all of how other people will react to it, I don't think, anyway. So, yeah, I find the Twitter works me and I'm happy enough to just kind of plow on with it. Like, I've never, I've never, um, it hasn't affected me that I only have a few thousand followers on TikTok, put it that way. <laughs> um, but, yeah, but th- the thing about it as well is it is addictive. That's, that's the thing it's worth saying. Like, Twitter's been very good to me. But like when a sketch comes out, like I have a sketch out today there now and I notice like the amount of work I'll do in the morning when the sketch is out, it wrap, it falls through the ground like because I'm kind of keeping an eye on it and somebody high profile shares it. I think it's important to say this stuff actually like it is a little bit addictive and it's set up yeah. to make you feel like you're doing very well out of it. But you're getting a few extra hundred followers, which is great. But I mean, Twitter getting all the advertising and stuff. So, I mean, and sorry to, to finalize the thing on the 220. Why I think it's great as well is I don't think you should really get into making eight or nine minutes because they're movies then. Like if something's mm-hmm. got great production values and you're making movies on Twitter for no cash, like and it's an eight or nine minute idea, for me then you're giving away, I think, too many of hopefully your, your longer form ideas. So the 220 is fine. The production values, they're not the right home boat, but they're good enough. And hopefully that'll be enough to, to elicit interest from people who might think this guy's worth longer form a punt on a longer form project which thankfully is kind of already happening so right now are you not monetizing i don't know if this is a personal question but are you not able to monetize any content from twitter is it just from people seeing you and then being invited to do gigs in places well to be fair now i have a patreon so i think most uh creators on twitter that i can see anyway everyone's got something there's like ko-fi and there's patreon and there's a few others so i'm fucking very lucky like i have a patreon and i do I put out sketches earlier there than I do on social media. I do outtakes and I do podcasts. And I, because I sing as well, I've got my myself and my buddy Sully do like the odd gig. Like we did a Christmas gig there now recently and stuff. And that stuff always goes down really well. So I do extra bits for Patreons and I do, I have got like, I don't know, I think maybe around 300 patrons um, and they're contributing every month. So that is amazing. So, amazing. But, but I'm not getting any direct money from Twitter. Like if that's, if that's your question, you you never get to the point where Twitter go, geez, you're flying for us. Like, you know, you're doing really well in your jurisdiction. Here's some cash that doesn't happen at all. So, which is a little, like, I mean, you just need to accept the terms of the game. The game is there's no money, but we can, we can uh, promote you and, and you can do, I mean, for instance, they're, they're now during lockdown, like without Twitter, I'm stuck as at, a, at the level of a guy who was doing okay gigs leading into lockdown. And then I have to effectively without Twitter, press pause on my career for two years and then try and get back in at that not particularly high level like do you know what I mean like and I'm not I'm not making and I'm not saying like I'm a I'm an abject failure and I'm in a dark place but I'm just saying like I wasn't a comedy superstar or anything leading into it so I can't at the end of the two years go nice one I start booking my stadiums again whereas in with Twitter in that two years as you were saying I was able to double triple quadruple my following um, and like develop relationships with people who are interested in longer form work as well. So I I couldn't give out about it. It's been very good to me. Like, but you're not making any money from it if anybody's interested in that. Wow, I'm so glad about Patreon and and like buy me a coffee or whatever that that other one is as well. You know, because because they keep you going and then it keeps your content going up. Because you couldn't be doing this, you wouldn't have the time to produce mm-hmm. at the level that you're producing. You know, without that kind of stuff. But uh, I've a I've a question. Uh, what's the favorite video you've ever made? If you could highlight one. Yeah, definitely. I'd say there's one just came to mind um, as soon as you asked the question, which is that I did a Palestine and Israel one um in the middle of i think yeah the second lockdown i think was about may of last year and it's my favorite one because 
um, in the build-up, I've been doing um, lots of these geopolitical videos and stuff. And, it, the, you know, you'd get into these kind of tit-for-tats with um, digits on Twitter, like kind of faceless digits. And they'd be kind of saying things like, oh, it's virtue signaling. Or, or another person actually said, well, there's no point to satire, actually. Like, it's just you just do this thing. And then this is a school of thought. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but the school of thought is that like satire, you know, it just it just highlights the problem um from kind of almost like within the establishment and a lot of establishment people just kind of go oh isn't that very bad and then we all go on about our business so there's no practical utility to satire and um, so then i didn't do this video to prove that point wrong i'm not i'm not that in, i'm not roy Keane like but i did this um israel palestine sketch um where i feel like i, I mean i i genuinely spent about three weeks i think researching that um and i attached a fundraiser to it and the fundraiser raised like I think 32 grand or something for um the IADA camp in Bethlehem and um, because they were going through like just fucking desperate times in in COVID or whatever they needed basic medical supplies so in that one tiny little example the the satire actually had a function it had a tangible utility that it, that it raised money and um, for people that need it and stuff you know so uh, <laughs> i'm not going into it like you know i'm not saying i'm a people that need kind of children's and need kind of guy like either but i'm just giving it as an example where like i i definitely felt that it was a worthwhile experience like researching something that i'm passionate about and doing a video that then actually in that one moment anyway the bit of satire had you know something tangible came at the end of it you know so that was yeah that's probably my favorite i think i just i just love I just love Palestine anyway to be honest I just love anything any little bit I could do to highlight what's going on there I think is it's just kind of an honor really and I thought you were going to say maybe you raised like a thousand or two thousand like thirty thousand is a significant amount for a you know a video on social media to generate like that's mm -hmm. I think that's really really impressive I, I never realized that about that video I watched that video at the time I didn't um I didn't actually notice that I could have uh, clicked somewhere I'm sorry I didn't uh but like you know <laughs> Can I go back and do it now? I'm sorry, I'll do it afterwards. <laughs> Give me a tenner there next time you see me. But it's the generosity I do like as the well, idea, though. Though, of Twitter. Sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead, do, like, sorry, I do like the idea of Twitter turning up at your door, though, with cash and uh, and giving it to you as a, as a sketch idea. But sorry for interrupting you there. No. <laughs> yeah, no, I was, yeah, just, I was just kind of repeating myself, really, I suppose, really, that... Uh, it's, it was the generosity of people as well, though. There was it was there was just a nice buzz about it. I was like, well, you know, sometimes you kind of go, what's the point of all this, really? Like, you're kind of in your gaff. You're creating videos. You're checking, you know, to see how they're going down. And you're looking like, oh, my follower content is kind of going up. That's great. Like, outside of a boost to your own ego, um, what really is a kind of a, is, is in terms of well-being for, for you and outside yourself, what's the point of any of it? And I suppose in that moment, it all just seemed to make total sense that if you if you increase your followers and you do something like that and you build up a nice relationship with them, hopefully, which I maybe have done and you put something out, people want to support you and support the cause. And it translates into an actual practical good that way. You know, so that was great. Amazing. Amazing. And then I'm not sure if this is the same video, but what's the most popular video you've ever made? And why do you think it resonated so much with your audience? Um, I suppose the most popular has to be and this actually kind of kicked off the, the Twitter kind of bonanza for a few months was um, I did a video of loyalism in a house share in Cork. Um, and it was I think it was popular because, well, again, I, I spent a lot of time on it and it hopefully was was reasonably well put together. But I think the reason it was popular as well, because it was like it was kind of controversial. So it was on the BBC view um, that night and there was lots of complaints into the BBC because they felt that. The depiction of the loyal the loyalist character was um kind of unbelievable and uh, offensive um but again there now i think that's a nice example where i was able to hopefully defend myself quite well over the next kind of <laughs> two or three weeks of uh, backlash because i felt strongly that the loyalist character was the most likable in the house that he was just that he was just loyal that's all it was i was just kind of commenting on the absurd position that he finds himself in really and um, rather than being him being gormless or unlikable in any way and um, so that yeah i think that it was comical because usually i'd be hoping for you know if i got like 10 or twenty thousand views on a video before that one i was kind of saying all right okay like we're, we're kind of holding our own here like you know and uh, that morning when i put that video out i went off to do a voiceover gig and i came home 
and I check my little video as I'm having my lunch and it's usually like be as I say now 10 or 20 thousand you're like come on on the lads and uh it it had like I don't know kind of two or three hundred thousand views and I was just like what the heck because I'd never had anything like that before I've heard of other people my stuff usually wasn't didn't go down well at all it was <laughs> kind of too too all over the shop but this one it was like you're, you're in the midst of a hit and uh it's mad like that you you like you'll never see some of the comments that's the thing that i found almost kind of sad or something because people be like dropping you nice comments you will literally never see them you'd have to you'd have to have a team sitting down to look at a video like that no i'm not saying this happens all the time by god it doesn't but in that particular instance where something's really taken off like this and again it's so uh it's so addictive like it's the dopaminergic rush like you're getting is like oh my god every time you refresh it it's new followers and new uh likes and stuff like that but um but yeah, that was that was the most popular. I don't know what I ever reached those those heights again. To be honest, I think it was like uh, nearly close to two million views on on Twitter alone, and then lots of others on the other formats as well. So yeah, and a load of death threats as well for to run into the mix. Well, that's what I'm going to ask about next. But firstly, like you know, this is the year of the manifestation, Tyke, and your word is very important. So if you say that you mm. might not ever get those views again, be careful with that because you true, definitely true. will, and I know you will, and one hundred percent. But how do you handle those negative comments? Because that is something that I couldn't do. I don't make any content that is any way controversial. And even if someone kind of, you know, one time when I was presenting years ago now on YouTube for a sports channel, um, a guy wrote, "She has teeth like a horse and a butterface." And I was like, oh, but her face, like a buttery complexion. And then my friend was like, no, no, everything is good, but her face. And I was like, ah, that is so mean. But I actually was like, actually like, was able to separate from it because I was like, that's just about my looks and stuff. So, so whatever, you know, but mm -hmm. if I was to take a stance on something political and to, I know now you're not taking a stance in it, but you're, 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 you're producing information that could be conceived to have a stance or something like that. And then people attack you. I don't know how you don't have heart attacks and you don't, you're not like sick and you're not like replying to those, like how is, is, is are you just made that way? I'm not made that way. Like, I mean, I'm not impervious to feeling the usual thing that we, I mean, I'm, I'm a human being at the end of the day, but I suppose it's worth saying that I bring some of it on myself. Um, in so far as, I mean, I'm not going out deliberately to, to provoke people. Well, no, sometimes I am, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I know it's coming, put it that way. I know it's coming. So again, it's like, it's the rules of, of engagement, isn't it? Like, you know, you have to be a big boy and throw on your big boy pants if you're going to do certain types of material, I find. So I could absolutely stay out of this world and do comedy that I wouldn't maybe feel that I totally believe in or I'm not that strong, uh, that I'm not that strong at, but I feel like I'm stronger over here and it's because you're more passionate about it. So then you have to take what's coming. Now, having said all that, there's days where you could be having a little tit for tat with somebody online and you feel like you're you're you know holding your own or maybe even defeating them in this kind of pseudo intellectual battle and then but suddenly you feel drained it's coming towards the end of the day and you're like well who's won this battle like i'm going around telling people about this little spat that i'm having with the solicitor and i've given him some information about the second world war that he didn't appear to know and it then you realize that you've just got lost in your own ego again so what i have found in the last few months particularly is if I'm ex I think there's an old political phrase of um which works for comedy so well as well as that if you're explaining you're losing and I think that's that's really it's really helped me a lot in the last few months I'm like if I put something out I've done the research and people are commenting underneath going this is a load of shit that never happened that not that's not the chain of events leading up to war War <laughs> one or something like that <laughs> and I feel like my research is is just done that's it it's done like the sketch is out there. If you like it, great. If you don't like it, that's also fine. Do you know what I mean? Like, so I find by not... Also, what I found, right, in the early days, I'd be going around the first few sketches that went crazy. I'd be in Cork and someone would say, how do you deal with the negativity? Like, the amount of hate that you're getting is crazy. And I'm like, I actually wasn't getting that much hate. I'm getting <laughs> thousands of comments. People going, fucking fair play to you. This is great. I love this. I love this. And then you get a few negative comments. And the thing was, I was retweeting them. So I was retweeting and thinking that I, again, was having the upper hand because I'd take the piss out of the guy hurting me. But what am I doing? It's just ego games. Like, I'm trying to defeat the troll kind of thing, you know? So it was only when I, I feel like I was amplifying the negativity. And don't get me wrong now, there's particularly particularly women, actually, right? Uh, women online, people of color as well, definitely. And I suppose female people of color are the ones that will feel it the most. But I noticed that the difference between the, the abuse that I get as a sketch comic and then women in around my 
world in the political kind of sketch comedy stuff and in around my numbers get heinous abuse online right so i'm not i'm not saying don't amplify it but i'm just for me as long as i view that the, the trolling to not be personal if it's not like a person that which it very rarely is what usually happens with the twitter thing is that it's so kind of marinated in ideology that they're not it's not a personal attack they've like pinpointed me as some sort of left-leaning terrorist apologist uh this kind of shinner plant and uh there he is now doing his usual thing so they're viewing everything i'm doing through that prism so they're abusing the kind of ideological creation that they've created themselves not me so why would you be taking that personally you know and why would you why would you be wasting six or seven hours conversing with somebody like that so long story short I would leave off an awful lot of it unless somebody is accusing you of doing something that you haven't left. If it's slander, I would reply to slander. <laughs> but otherwise, I would go, look, I'm making a fucking video. Like, if you like it, great. If you don't, you're great. And then there's so many people showing you such good vibes, then, like, focus on those, I suppose. I haven't said all that. If a, if a, if a little brawl comes up, I wouldn't be a shrinking violet either. I'd take somebody on if they... If, if I feel that it would further the conversation, you know? So, like, for instance, I'm very passionate about the North and um the, the basically the plight of northern nationalists to be heard in the south would be would be like something that i'd be very passionate about so if there's somebody high profile um given the usual kind of mentality that you get down here which is basically like telling them to kind of shut up up there like you know and sort yourselves out i will probably get involved in that if i feel i can further it on but i always very conscious of why am i doing this why am i getting involved if it's ego is it trying to convince people that i'm i'm smart or that I'm talented or whatever, that should all happen if it happens at all in the sketch itself, not in the kind of barroom brawl that happens afterwards. <laughs> My God, the barroom brawl. That's a great way of putting it. God, like, yeah, I, I think it's a credit to you. And I think I'm, I, I'm not quick. I am a slow thinker. And I find... <laughs> it's it, all, Judy. You're very hard yourself. It takes me a while, you know, to kind of process things and to think about things. So if someone started attacking me on Twitter, I can't even imagine what I'd say. Like, I'd end up anyway looking like the the the, the slow one. Whereas I think, I don't know, your brain works at a different... Uh, RPM, I think that you're quick enough to be able to respond in a way that's not a personal attack on the person or anything like that. And I don't know, every time I've seen it anyway, it always comes across very level headed, almost like there's someone else outside of you writing it, like that your ego, <laughs> like you managed to shut your ego off completely. And it's just like an objective response to the thing, which I think is is the best way um, about it. But have you ever uploaded a video and then pressed upload and then thought, actually, I, I don't know about this, it might piss people off or it's not produced well enough or anything like that and then deleted it. One time in my life, I posted something and I realised that the audio and the visual <laughs> were out of sync. <laughs> I deleted it straight away. No, I have a kind of an attitude where like, I feel, again, if the research is done, like, I, I'll give you one example of something I was about to shoot and then my daughter pulled me aside like my daughter's 17 and she's got so much more sense than I and she was 16 at the time and um, she's got so much more sense than I ever would I was going to do something in around Afghanistan and there'd been events in Kabul at the, in that week that were people had lost their life and my daughter was like do you know what I can see what you're trying to do here and I know you're doing it for the right reasons but it's so tense right now I don't know if this will will play well that you're doing a video on this like and you could be capitalizing on the fact that this story has just erupted now this week. Um, and I actually sat down and thought about it. And I was like, oh yeah, you're right. Like I'm, <laughs> I wouldn't listen to many people and take their advice directly. Like what well, my daughter is definitely one of them. Um, but no, other than that, if the research is done, put up the video. I've definitely put stuff up and, and I've thought in hindsight, no, that hasn't worked as well at all at all. Like, and it has actually offended a few people, but I don't like the idea of kind of erasing your history or something it's kind of like yeah. well this this is the thing i've done now and it's there as a kind of an indicator of like that's one that didn't work out all that well and it's i find it's kind of like just i have a kind of a warts and all mentality like i think it's because like being an alcoholic you have to do an awful lot of kind of soul searching afterwards when you get into recovery and there's no real it doesn't really work for me i don't think to kind of paper over cracks and kind of go can we just eliminate that 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 and that i have to come more to kind of a mentality of well, this is all part of who I am. You know what I mean? Some of these are some of these things are more beautiful 
than others <laughs> and this over here is really ugly but like it is kind of part of the whole makeup that got me to this point so i don't delete tweets i don't delete videos do i fail in so far as like did i intend it to be stronger than it is all the time i fail all the time like anyone that i think who, who's anyway decent fails all the time like um you know so so to answer your question no and i think i think if you start deleting stuff as well you're kind of to creating that kind of editorial on yourself that way that's not really what the what social media is giving us it's actually an opportunity to kind of do away with that period where you have to go through a broadcaster or a commissioner and get them to say yeah or yes or no you know so i'd say i'd be telling people like power on then sit down with all your videos over the course of a month or or, or six months and you're kind of saying well if i'm interested in pursuing something this this and this seems to be working very well like and this over here i thought of See, what happens with me is I find loads of stuff funny. And then I realize that it's just me that thought <laughs> that was funny after I put the video out. <laughs> but that's a great, like, if you keep deleting that stuff, the evidence is no longer there. Then the hard evidence is no longer there. So you just, I don't know, would you learn as well if you keep deleting? Um, yeah, to sum up, warts and all. But I think that that's great advice. And I think I'm going to listen to that myself as well, because, you know, I kind of transitioned from video into a professional job for a few years there. And it all became about being professional. And I kind of went through my Facebook at the start of the job and kind of deleted all the pictures that I had with dreadlocks and and kind of all that, that side of myself. So I'd just be this polished version of myself. But <laughs> since leaving kind of that professional job, now I'm like, I have the opportunity now to be myself. I'm not sure almost how to do that yet how to yeah. like you know make that step because like yeah I think I was watching a video yesterday and they were talking about boundaries there's some things that you never ever bring up or include but then you have to kind of be yourself as well but you kind of have to work mm -hmm. that out but I think I'm going to re-watch exactly that your answer there about not deleting content um because I think that that is actually very very um helpful advice for a lot of people um and then just a, just a couple of more now Tyg because uh I don't want to keep okay. you for your whole, for your whole lunch break but what are some of the biggest lessons about creating videos that you've learned over the past few years, whether planning, filming or editing? I'd say the number one thing there, right, is to do what you think is funny. So I definitely wasted a lot of time. I suppose it's all kind of grades, isn't it? Like, I mean, people might think that I was early on, I'd be like, do my own thing completely. And I kind of was, but I always I always had one eye on oh, would this land like with people like that. And when you go through a process with RT and I'm trying to be as grateful as I can, cause I'm delighted for the early opportunities that I got with RT, but it was also, it was also pretty shit. Like, to be honest, you know, and you're kind of, you're spat out just as you're kind of getting going and they do take the edge off a lot of the kind of ideas that you think are strong. It's a mixed bag, but the RT experience definitely taught me that I had spent too much time thinking about what RT would like or what the average person watching RT too would enjoy. It's good to think of your audience, but if, if that kind of thinking is too upfront, if it's dominating at the start, then you won't actually get to reify the idea that has gotten you interested in the first place, I suppose. That's the best advice I could give anyone. Like I sat down in lockdown, um, the very first lockdown, and I thought to myself, well, you know, the gigs are all cancelled now. It kind of feels like the world is kind of burning. Um, I can't actually do anything from my home at the moment. So I did a little, I did a, uh, I did it. I'm not bringing up another fundraiser. <laughs> I'm liable to turn into Bono here, but I did a little, a little fundraiser. So that was good to, for my karma, like in my own sense of like, okay, I'm just doing something here with this kind of video thing for PH House. And then that was done. And there's obviously there's just this chasm of time opening up in front of you. And I thought to myself, do know the exact thing that you always want to do. Like write the thing that you always wanted to do. It's not particularly controversial or anything. It's just, it was more political. It was more the comedy that I wanted to do. And like, lo and behold, those first few videos, like they all started to do very well, you know? And it's like, I couldn't believe, I was almost kicking myself. I was like, why would you ever stray from the exact thing that you want to do? Because the only chance you have of nailing something to the point where it's really strong is the thing that you're passionate about or that you identify with the most. Like, I just feel like I wasted so much time and I see people around me wasting so much time sitting down thinking, what'll play well on YouTube? You know, what? <laughs> What do TikTok want? Like, I, I openly have no understanding of TikTok. I don't know what's going on. Like, my 17-year-old daughter finds it very hard to understand what's going on in it. So what hope do I have, like, profoundly deep into my late 30s? 
And um, Instagram, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. Like, spent some time trying to figure it out. It makes no sense. The world makes no sense to me. Twitter, for all its problems, makes perfect sense to me. Like, I just, it just makes, it, it just works. So do the thing that you want to do and forget. There's no commissioners knocking on the door just yet anyway, guys. Like, for most people. So don't be thinking about them. They'll mm-hmm. think about you when you perfect the thing that you're strong. And it's like the old cliche in storytelling. Um, write what you know. Don't write a sketch that you saw this other guy doing. Like, oh, that did quite well. Now, if I do something about cats or if I do, <laughs> do a silly voice here or... No, do the thing that you think is is funny and it, the audience will give it back to you like tenfold. And, and if that doesn't work, just make a video about cats. <laughs> It'll probably go viral. <laughs> silly voices are very funny. <laughs> <laughs> I've done many, many a silly voice myself, but not not that many cats. I'm going. I'm going to th- throw a, a a a bigger question at you, Tyke. And uh, I'm sorry if you don't have the answer, or if it's too hard to answer, because it's mo- the most difficult question that anyone could ever answer. But like, and I love asking people this. But what do you think your purpose is? Maybe just in general, and maybe it's a career purpose or purpose in life. And I know it's a bit woo woo, but like, yeah. have you kind of managed to define that? Because I haven't. <laughs> That's a lovely question. And actually somebody asked me something similar um, earlier on this morning, which is which is uh, bizarre. But yeah, um, I do think I have a purpose. Yeah, and I think the more the more singular you get, the easier it is to stick with it. It's I found like when I was younger, it was uh, particularly in my early 20s. I was like, I think you're kind of funny, mate. Or I think you could be in a band, could you? Or I think you're would you go to college? Like and my head just seemed to be like very busy. Whereas these days I kind of feel like there's I suppose there's something twofold going on. The comedy, and I've definitely found this in the last like couple of years, where some of the sketches do very well, and you get messages from people saying that it helped, it helped them, it, it they connected with it in some way, it either brightened their day or, um, it helped to sort of, for, for instance, with Northern Nationalists, and I don't ever want to speak for them, whatever, but there is like it's just a complete blackout of understanding in the south, um, about Northern Nationalists. So like I've definitely when I went up to Belfast a few times the last year. People would say, "Oh, just nice one for for throwing that out online." It just meant a lot that that people in the south, more people might get a sense of this or that or whatever. Uh, so that's obvious, then, isn't it? Like your your purpose is to be the jester or the clown or whatever, who's able to hopefully at times hold a mirror up to nature and and make people laugh and they'll enjoy their day on the way. And that's that's all I want to do. I don't want to. I want to do that as well as I can possibly do it. Do you know, so I don't want to be on, I don't want to be on particular radio shows or I don't want to be on, it has to be this or I have to earn this amount of money at that time. And I'm not saying that being a hero, but that wouldn't be the thing that would motivate me at all. It never has. But it's like finding the thing that you're strong at and being surviving. So like I had, I had a life threatening illness in terms of alcoholism. Like, you know, there's no understanding of it in Ireland at all, really. But it's not like I drank too much and I need to stop drinking because... I couldn't make it to work. It was like an absolute existential battle to not die. And the fact that I didn't, I feel like, okay, that's brilliant. I'm really grateful that that, that happened. So what I need to do now is keep myself in good enough form. First of all, that's the first challenge. And then I would say pursue the thing that you feel that maybe deep down inside you were probably born to do. Do that as well as you can, because it seems to be helping other people. And if you're not, if you're not helping other people, like you're kind of lost anyway. So yeah, I actually feel like it's, for years, I haven't woken up and thought, what am I supposed to be doing? I haven't felt that way for years, although I did feel it every day for kind of maybe 30, 32 or three years. Like, But I think when it does click click in, it, it's certainly a nice feeling that I have, if I was doing comedy work, hopefully longer form stuff, a lot of live stuff and some online stuff as well, helping people along the way and um being there for some young drunk or or drug addict who'd be confused as to whether he can have any kind of a life that would be enjoyable after they stop if i could do all that until i die great do you know there's not there's nothing else really amazing amazing my mum became an addiction counsellor when i was like 12 years old and i remember like her, she collected oh, me from like yeah. irish college and she was like but how, how do you really feel and i was like oh my god what what <laughs> you and then the rest of my life became how do I feel and looking deep within and who am I and all this kind of stuff so uh so I'm, I'm recovering from that um but no it was it was great though <laughs> because it, it, 
it made me question things and it made me feel okay to have deep conversations with people off the cuff as well you know like yeah. like there's, there's no no question anyone could ask me that I'd be like oh, or you know I'd be like interesting I've never and it makes you analyze yourself as well and I think even when I'm watching TikToks like you know I kind of stop and go why am I scrolling through this so fast I, I I'm lucky to have this ability to stop and go why do I like that and then and then I kind of pause on it or take a screenshot and I'm like what do I like about that and I really try and get into yeah, yeah. It with myself and stuff but the purpose thing I think is 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 a challenge even for me and you know I went back to a real job and that's when I started to feel very low I started to feel really right. depressed and I started to lose all sense of kind of purpose and since I and it wasn't the job it wasn't nothing to do with the the place that I worked or anything like that but since leaving and having my freedom back <clears throat> I've dropped salary for sure, but I, it's all become so exciting again. It's all become like, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I, you know, I text you on Twitter. Sorry, I'm such a, I'm such a boomer. I text you on Twitter. I send you a tweet. <laughs> and, uh, it was like, do you want to do an interview with me? And you were like, yeah. And then I get to do that, you know, and I'm yeah. doing something exciting later today and tomorrow's going to be exciting. And, you know, I, I have, I have it back and I didn't know if I was going to get it back. And I'm, I'm just so grateful um, that I have it and to be able to have this chat with you as well today. So, But, but what was the point of the, you know, say if it was the full time job, like what was the point of that? And I'm certainly not judging people because we all do it. But like, is the point to make more money, like so that you'd be a slight, little bit more comfortable in your house? Like, because that seems to be what it's like <laughs> go on more holidays, but be in this job that you that you're not interested in i i would find that very tough and i've i suppose i've done the thing now where i've done the thing that i wanted to do with with drinking the hell out of it at the same time as well but doing the thing i wanted to do for years knowing like in back in the day there was no money really coming from it at all because i couldn't get my shit together to have like regular income at all but still sticking with it then so now the fact that there is some amount of money like not you know i'm not buying ferraris or anything but i would you know i can get by now um with it it's just such a bonus then do you know what i mean like and it's it's but you'd want some staying power as you know though like people say to me all the time you know when you meet people on the street and they say like fair play to you for sticking with it <laughs> so, so funny as if i had all these other like you know medicine degrees like you know to back me up that i stuck with comedy like you know sure it's the only thing that i could fucking do <laughs> amazing and tell me what is next for tyke what's 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 on your actually you, and you were talking about it earlier i think you you've you had a mention to the, the bigger goal and so what's yeah. next firstly in the medium term or short term and then what what is that bigger goal yeah so there's there's a few like i mean i say i keep talking about this longer form thing i'm actually annoying myself with that phrase now but basically like the, you know i don't want to nothing wrong with it but i don't want to make sketches just sketches for like the next five years for instance do you know what i mean so the sketches were always i always want to do some of them but I want them to take like a backseat for a while as the longer form stuff takes form. So like I've done a one man show uh, about my alcoholism, um, which is why I talk so openly about it. Um, it's called In One Out The Other. I've done it like because of lockdown. I started about three years ago. But anyway, it's touring internationally this year, which is great. I've got some money from Culture Ireland. So I'm going to go to like the UK and Scotland. I'm going to go to like there's going to be gigs in Scotland, Wales. England and then the north of Ireland and lots of dates in there in the south of Ireland as well but then I'm writing a new show um which I'm going to hopefully launch for Dublin Fringe next year and then I would hopefully tour that the next year but in the midst of it all then I'm trying to turn this uh Brexit kind of world because it's my kind of obsession the geopolitics and the home nations Brexit orientated stuff into a full sitcom so at the moment I'm developing it with someone else and it's very early stages, like, so I won't kind of bang on about it too much. But uh, there is some interest from production companies about trying to to sell a kind of a drama comedy um, set in these kind of two houses. Um, one in one lives effectively England, Scotland, Wales. And in the other house lives Ireland and upstairs is nationalism and unionism. Um, I play most of the home country roles and then other people come in as guest characters whatever so i'm basically trying to turn the loyalism sketch into a sitcom i've got a partner and there's a few production companies interested so um and i'd be a determined kind of fella right so i'm happy enough remember when you said earlier about your don't don't say anything that's not going to happen or say stuff that is going to happen i'm going to do that i'm going to make a sitcom of this brexit thing come hell or high water amazing amazing and uh one second there now let me just test something can you hear it Yay! <laughs> superb, superb interview as well. You, I think you've 
like you structured it very well. I think, yeah, I think I give I would give yourself another one of those before you before you finish. <laughs> Wait, there now. Let's see what 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 else do we have? <laughs> uh, uh, no, that's not going to work. But uh, maybe, <laughs> and that's oh, I turned it down. <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Ty, you are an absolute gent. I love chatting to you in general every day you of the know. week. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to ride your coattails to a uh, <laughs> success. Um, and You're all I- welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ty. See you later. Thank you. Bye. Bye.